Here is Dr. Gino Chiapetta. Dr. Chiapetta is an associate, um, a clinical associate professor at the medical school. He is another one of our spine surgeons. He's going to be talking about low back injuries. Okay. All right. Thank you. Is there a clicker or a pointer? This guy here? Yep. All right. Well, good morning. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Eric, for putting this together. Um, I'm Gino Chiapetta, spine surgeon here at University of Orthopedics, and with Rutgers, Robert Wood Johnson. Um, I have the task of talking about lumbar spine injuries, of course, the black hole of medicine with back pain. Um, so these are my disclosures. So basically, in the lumbar spine, we treat younger patients, especially athletes, adolescents, a little different than the older patient population for a number of reasons. Younger athletes, younger patients typically don't have arthritic degenerative changes uh, much more commonly seen than the older adult population. So lumbar strains and sprains are not as common in the younger population when it comes to athletic type injuries. And back pain that stops from someone from participation, particularly high-level athletes, really needs you know, good evaluation, good workup um, by a physician or a therapist, a chiropractor, or whatnot. So low back pain is one of the most common reasons for missed playing time by professional athletes. Um, low back pain in athletes can range anywhere from 1% to 30%, depending upon the studies you read, depending upon the type of athlete and sport or activity they participate in. And most, most patients are self-limited. Most things get better with time. Um, they can be contusions. They can have strains and sprains and just overstress injuries as well. Um, so, but many athletes do have persistent symptoms. So low back pain accounted for up to 30% of the lost playing time for, in a study with 145 college football players. 38% of tennis players reported low back pain for missing at least one tournament during a season. And 90% of all tour injuries in, in professional golfers um, involve the neck or back. So very high, very high rate in golfers, especially in neck and lower back. You know, we know about Tiger Woods. And highest in gymnasts, wrestlers, and rowers because of hyperextension of the lumbar spine with the type of activity and load that they place on the lower backs. So it's a very uh, big differential diagnosis for patients, especially adolescents and athletes. Um, they range from, from muscle strains to disc herniations to pars fractures and spondylolisthesis to annular tears. And they can get problems just like anyone else. They can have things like neoplasms or disc space infections, which aren't very common, but things we think about. Um, disc space infections are higher in the pediatric population than adults um, as well. So we'll look at things like a disc herniation. So these typically start with non-operative treatment, usually. We don't really recommend bed rest. You know, if they're hobbled and have terrible pain, it's okay to, to lay up for a bit, but we like to get them up and moving. We get them mobilized in physical therapy pretty quickly. So anti-inflammatories can be used, an anti-inflammatory choice, Aleve, Advil, Motrin, Diclofenac, a whole number of them. Tordol is very commonly used in the training room as well, injectable, intramuscular. Um, medjool dose pack, a short course of oral steroids is commonly used. It's a very powerful anti-inflammatory. It starts at a 30 milligram um, dosage of methylprednisolone and decreased six, six millimeters a day over a five day period. We have shown some improvement with that. It takes some of the sting off the radicular pain, the sciatica down the leg. Epidural steroid injections can be used to inject steroid around uh, disc herniations and um, selective nerve root injections, which are epidurals, um, are very safe and can be very effective to avoid surgery. So looking at epidural steroid injections for disc herniations in NFL athletes. Um, so there was a study done from looking at athletes from 2003 to 2010. They had almost a 90%, 89% success rate for return to play for improvement of pain after epidural steroid injections. Um, and interesting, you know, there was a very, very small loss of time. They only, the only lost on average almost three practices in less than one game. Um, the, the ones that did not return, the 11% was a sequestration of disc herniation on MRI, meaning usually those are pretty big disc herniations, the sequestered disc herniations, so they can be a little more troublesome and may require surgery. And any, so any weakness on physical exams, such as weakness to dorsiflexion, weakness in the quad, weakness in the, um, in the intrinsics of the foot and ankle um, can be a red flag and can mean usually a lot more nerve compression, probably a bigger disc herniation. 
So we know that disc herniations treated with epidural injections and in NFL athletes at least are very safe and effective. So microdiscectomy, looking at microdiscectomy procedures. So basically a microdiscectomy surgery is a pretty limited surgery. And all you're doing in surgery is removing the portion of disc that's ruptured and pressing on the nerve that's removed. That's a very small percentage of the disc itself. So in 1999, uh, Wang um, published a study on 14 elite athletes competing at the NCAA level. Mean age was just under 21 years. Of all the athletes, we had four football players, two basketball, two swimmers, two water polo, and one of each is soccer, track and field, volleyball, and diving. So we, he, the, all of them got a period of eight weeks of non-operative treatment. So they got the therapy, maybe epidural injections. So of all those five did not return to competition, two of those were football players. Of those five, those five, oh, sorry, did have surgery. Um, two had a single level discectomy, two had a three level, uh, two had a, three of them had a two level discectomy, one had a percutaneous discectomy, all different types of procedures. And of the nine of those 15 that returned, one football player played three years at college level, the rest still played professionally. So pretty high success rates. Um, Bob Watkins out of uh, Santa Monica, uh, California, he does treat a lot of NFL players, a lot of uh, professional athletes. So in 2003, he published a study of 60 Olympic and pro athletes who had microdiscectomy surgeries. So the surgical criteria for those having surgery, they had a hernia disc on an MRI, they had a leg pain while playing sport and failed a minimum of six weeks of non-operative treatment. Of those 60, 53 or 83% returned to the sport at an average of five months post-op. So a pretty long recovery for some of these patients. All the patients were started on PT with trunk, with trunk stabilization and sport-specific uh, therapy on average of three weeks post-op. So we don't start therapy right after surgery, give them a week or two to kind of heal up, you know, get over the surgical procedure, then start your therapy a few weeks later. So the interesting thing with return to sport, if you look at this table, Football players were 20 of those who had hernia disc, but only 15 of them returned to play. So only 75% returned to play rate. Um, so we see that the football players uh, have the most problematic uh, issues post-op, likely because of the demand of the physical sport. The baseball players, there was also 21 of them, but 19 returned, um, so a much higher success rate, and the rest, all of them returned. So the vast majority of failures were football players. And if someone's a lineman who's 6'6", 320 pounds, that's a lot of load on the lower back because, you know, normal discs don't herniate, okay? A normally healthy disc does not herniate. So if you're going to have a disc herniation, there is some level of degeneration of that disc. So there's always a little bit of dehydration of the disc on MRI. It could be collapsed. It could be extremely collapsed. Um, some of these people may have some preceding back pain throughout their playing career or even, you know, in regular life. Um, so a disc herniation does mean it's a little wear and tear of the lumbar spine already. So we have to keep that in mind all the time um, when treating these people. So with adolescent discectomies, those under the age of uh, 19, there was a study done with 72 patients, these were under the age of 16, that had lumbar microdiscectomy. And the biggest take home message for your teenage adolescent patients is there's an extremely high recurrent rate. So in those 72 that had a microdiscectomy procedure, 20 of them required a second surgery because they re-herniated the disc a second time. So when treating these younger patients, mostly the high school athletes, um, we counsel them and their parents that there's a very high risk that this can happen again, and that's with or without surgery. Why does it happen? You know, these patients, you'll be surprised. You look at their MRIs, and you're convinced that you're seeing the MRI of a 40 or 50-year-old because they have such early disc degeneration. Um, so they have early disc degeneration, likely from genetic predisposition. They likely have maybe an injury that happened in the past that, that, that's damaged the disc. Um, so there's just a very much higher um, rate of recurrence. In the adult population, it's quoted be about between 5 and 10% recurrent hernia disc rate. So a 28% rate is pretty high, extremely high. So that's the one thing you worry about. But of those 50 that did return, 46 noted occasional or no pain with activity. So a high, high rate of return to sport with just most of them doing very well. We'll move on to spondylolysis. The spondylolysis is the PARS defect that we see, and that can be with or without the spondylolisthesis or the slip. So basically it's a defect of the, of the of bone within the posterior ar arch of the spine. So the PARS basically connects the vertebral body and the pedicle to the back portion of the lamina of the spine. 
And everyone call you know, we call this in like stress fractures. So the patients say, oh, when, I, didn't, I didn't have an injury, how did I break it? Most of these aren't because of trauma. Most of these are because of developmental failure of bone to form. So typically it's about three to 6% in the general population, probably closer to 3%. In athletes, it is more variable. There are some athletes that have a higher predisposition. Those are more throwing athletes like pitchers and maybe people in track and field, divers, gymnasts, wrestlers, weightlifters, and rowers. So people with much more hyperextension type injuries. Gymnasts are very, very notorious for having this. Um, rowers for sure as well. So looking at the prevalence of these types of stress fractures in adolescent athletes, there was a large paper done uh, last year, 2017. They looked at over 1,000 adolescent athletes with low back pain. Uh, average age was about 15 years. So th 308 of those patients that had low back pain, 30% rate had spondylolysis. So the highest rates were gymnastics, band, I can't tell you why, and softball. And baseball, 54%, soccer, 48%, hockey, 44%. So, you know, very high rate. So 30% low back pain had um, uh, spondylolysis, so very common. So most co common cause of low back pain in athletes, an incidence does correlate with the growth spurt. So you can see these things become symptomatic um, as they go through the growth spurt and early puberty. So what does it look like on x-ray? So you, you, here we can see like a crack or like a break in the bone through here. It's a, so it virtually disconnects the vertebral body, sorry, vertebral body from the back part of the, the structural elements of the spine. So it makes this vertebral body almost free floating and it puts a lot of stress on the disc. So the vast majority of these patients will undergo non-operative treatment. Early on, we'll put them in a lumbar brace. We'll, we'll shut them down from sports for at least six weeks and then start a trunk stabilization program with physical therapy. I'm sorry. This one all the way to the front. So bracing. So bracing serves as an anti-lordotic orthosis preventing hyperextension, which can load through the stress fractures causing more back pain. The role and best type of external brace is debated. Basically, we, we use the one that they like to wear because if it's cumbersome, it makes them uncomfortable, it makes them look funny in front of their friends. They won't wear it because they're teenagers. And we mobilize for a period of at least four to six weeks to allow for healing prior to activity and physical therapy. So with non-operative treatment of rest and bracing, there's a 91% good to excellent results with 11 year follow-up. So that's a very good study. So 91% is a, is a, that's a great uh, result. 80% had good to excellent results with bracing and physical therapy. Another study done in 2000. Blanda had a nice study in 90, an older study in 93. They um, had 62 patients treated with symptomatic spondylolysis. They were, um, they were restricted from activity. They were braced from anywhere from two to six months and 84% or 52 of the 62 had excellent results. Eight had a good result and two had a fair result. Eight patients eventually had a fusion due to progression of the spondylolisthesis. So eight out of 62 eventually had to have surgery. So operative treatment, they do need surgery if, it's, uh, if it is due to uh, PARS defects and a slip. Most time, it's, it can, you can repair the PARS by placing screws in the vertebra ab above and a hook uh, at the vertebra below, and it kind of closes down where the fracture is or the, the stress fracture or the defect. You know, the problem with this area here, why doesn't it heal? It's very dense cortical bone, so it's very hard cortical bone. It just doesn't promote bony healing, so you have to surgically kind of repair this um, with screw fixation and bone graft. So if you look at the patients that do require surgery for this condition, how do they do? So there was 22 competitive athletes in a study uh, followed with repair of the PARS defects. The best results of the patients are ones that have screw fixation to repair the defect. 18 of those of 19 returned to sports, all but one with wiring failed. Uh, bracing was not needed post-op for playing. So pretty, pretty good rate. And then some patients just have unilateral PARS defects. We see it often where they'll have one stress reaction on one side of the spine and intact on the other side. And those, the big worry about those is that they can go on to having bilateral stress fractures if you allow them to keep playing if they're symptomatic. So those patients you have to shut down for a bit so they don't fracture the opposite side. Um, but these have a very, very high rate of healing. Like 98% of these will heal on their own and never require surgery. 
So we'll look at a couple of cases that we've done more recently. Um, so a 16-year-old female golfer with chronic progressive low back pain and right lower extremity pain. She had gone through physical therapy, anti-inflammatory. She stopped playing for a few months to see if that would help. She was also having pain with just sitting in class and pain with just everyday activities. Um, so she presented, so we got this MRI. And on the MRI, she has a couple of things. I'm sorry, I, 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 lost, I, had, I couldn't track down her pre-op x-rays, but she basically had spondylolysis at the L5-S1 segment here. And here, she had stress fractures, which are right here. And here, because of the slip of the spine, the neural foramen here gets very closed and to get neural compression. And the neural compression from the foraminal stenosis is what causes the referred leg pain. So because of her symptoms, we discussed with her and her mother, and she wished to move forward with surgery. And she underwent this procedure here, which is uh, an anterior and posterior fusion, where an anterior approach to the, uh, uh, in the abdominal area is performed to place a large graft window in the disc space, which is here. And then posteriorly from the back, with minimally invasive technique, we place screws in the vertebra to give some support. Um, and this is what it looks like. So this type of surgery takes like two hours, about start to finish. Um, so she did great. She went home two days after surgery, no complications surgery. She just took no pain medication, went home. She started to swing golf clubs four weeks from surgery, and she's completely pain-free. She's playing golf again, and she's not felt better than she has in years. So pretty good outcome thus far. So case two, this is a 53-year-old female. She's, she's a nurse in the labor and L&D unit, but I include her because you know, these patients are kind of like athletes, too, because she exercises regularly. She wants to go back to work. She's missing time from work. She can't exercise because of her back pain, so what do you do with her? So she's gone through physical therapy. She's gone through epidural injections. She's gone through using medications. So she presents, and nothing's really helped her. So she has, what's, she has this. So we can see, uh, you know, an AP x-ray, she has this scoliosis-type curvature of the spine. And here we can see at L5-S1, she has a pretty significant high-grade slip. So she has an L5-S1, she has PARS defect, she has like a grade three slip at L5-S1, and she has a scoliosis as well. So we can see her slip measures, you know, 16 millimeters or over a centimeter and a half. We can see, you know, the, the disc is completely collapsed. The foramen here is very collapsed because of the slip and disc base collapse. So th these patients get severe foraminal encroachment and severe foraminal compression of the exiting nerve roots, um, which usually will cause tight hamstrings, a lot of buttock and sciatica type pain into the hamstring. So MRI looks something like this, where we can see this is the L5-S1 disc, is complete bone on bone collapse. There's no disc, there's almost no disc here at all. She has a significant remodeling of the vertebral body because of the chronic nature. Um, but the disc all above here look perfect. And we can see here the severe, this is, this is a far, far lateral sagittal view, sorry, of the, uh, of the uh, MRI. And we can see here the foramen is just, she has, that's the nerve root there, she has severe foraminal stenosis from the slip and the collapse of the disc. So what do we do to her? So similar type surgery for her. We did an anterior and posterior surgery. We can see we got 100% reduction of the slip. It's back where it should be. The L5 and S1 vertebral bodies line up perfectly. And what happened to her scoliosis? Completely gone. So that was more of a painful, like, olesthetic scoliosis. It wasn't a true scoliosis, which you commonly will see with these patients. But you have to know that because some people may say, oh, she's in like, a fusion from her T12 to her sacrum. But if you just fixed her slip, the scoliosis is totally gone. And she, how did she do? So she returned to work in three months because she's an L&D nurse, has to be on her feet and, you know, squatting and bending and, you know, helping lift patients. She's completely pain-free. She takes no medications. She's back in the gym. She's the best she's felt in years. So another uh, high quality result. So case three is a 30-year-old female Olympic rower. She was part of the gold medal team that won in the Olympics uh, several, uh, many years ago. So she, had to, she was uh, training and developed severe acute low back pain with radiation to the right buttock, posterior thigh, and down to the calf. On exam, she had a very, very positive straight leg raise where you get her knee past 30 degrees of, 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 of extension and she's just like, you know, jumping off the table. And she had weakness in the S1 German tome, so she couldn't single stance toe raise. She had weakness like four to five strength, the dorsiflexion, and she had a little EHL weakness as well with an absent Achilles reflex. And she couldn't row, she couldn't row on her erg machine. She really couldn't do much without severe pain in her back into the buttock. 
So here are x-rays, typical rower x-rays, where her L5S1 disc here is extremely collapsed and degenerated. Straight spine, no scoliosis, no signs of any PARS defects or anything else, which you would suspect or be worried about in this patient population. So we get an MRI, and what does she have? She has this, you can see this huge disc. So here's L5S1, you see a lot of disc degeneration here, a lot of collapse of the disc. And she got this huge herniated disc here, and here you can see in the eye, so you see the size of this thing. It's like this huge like gumball in her, in her spinal canal. Sometimes they call it like a disc defecation, it's like the disc like poops into the spinal canal because it's so big. Um, so we would perform the microdiscectomy on her, you know, which is an excision of that large hernia disc fragment. She had complete pain relief, her strength returned with PT and training. She returned to rowing in six weeks and full participation in six months, so a really good outcome. For her, you get concerned because she has disc degeneration already. You know, she would be high, high worry about recurrence of the herniation as well as low back pain in the future because she has degenerative changes of that disc already. So we look at, you know, return to play for athletes who have or do not have surgery. They should have significant improvement of all symptoms to return to play. They should have full strength on exam. They should have full range of motion documented for the lumbar spine. The pain should be manageable enough to play without need of analgesics or abnormal movement patterns. To, they don't want to put them at risk for injury, of course. So after microdiscectomy, patients can typically return to sport at six to eight weeks for non-contact sports, four to six months for contact sports, because this is the big question, if I have surgery, when can I go back? Patients who go back sooner may have a little worry for recurrence. So if you like football, J.J. Watt had a microdiscectomy. He went back to play seven weeks from surgery, and he soon after had a recurrent disc herniation, had surgery, and lost the entire season. So sometimes getting back too soon will just prolong your recovery in the long run. And that's a hard thing to convince them of, but if they listen to you, they should do fine. So the Watkins criteria, Bob Watkins, uh, the spine surgeon previous, came up with criteria, four bullet points for patients to return to sport. Trunk stabilization program has to be completed with rigorous training and physical therapy. They should have excellent aerobic conditioning uh, prior to return to play. The athlete had returned to a satisfactory level of mastery of the skills necessary to perform in the sport. And stretching and strengthening exercises specific, specific to that sport could be performed. So if patients do require lumbar fusions, they'll require six to 12 months for non-contact sports. No data is available for adult athletes undergoing spinal fusion for return to play, such as like fusions for football players. They're very uncommon, not really done much. And disc replacement with a prosthetic disc is likely not a great um, option for these patients due to the pounding of, uh, of the lower back in these contact sports can lead to early failure of a disc replacement uh, prosthesis. So a spine surgery success story, so Tiger Woods, everyone who likes golf, and the Tiger struggled the past several years, why? Um, he has a pretty bad back, okay? He doesn't, he doesn't just have like a herniated disc, so he had two microdiscectomies, he had very temporary relief, never really had full relief, still struggled. So eventually, you know, his back pain worsened, he stopped playing for a while, still couldn't play after a period of rest and physical therapy and whatnot. So what happened, so he finally had an anterior lumbar fusion. He had an anterior lumbar fusion, standard anterior fusion of his L5S1 disc. He rehabbed, he recovered, and now he's almost completely pain free. He's playing the best he has in years. And sometimes these patients, you know, should have a fusion up front and not worry about these smaller procedures that don't work. Um, for conditions that he had. He had a spondylolisthesis at L5-S1, and that's why his microdiscectomy has never worked. Um, but eventually now he's doing pretty good. So patients can have spinal fusions and be high-level athletes. I think it's a lot of myths of spine surgery that if I have surgery, I'll, have, I'll be worse or I'll never be able to play again, and that's completely unfounded. That's based upon nothing. There's no science to say that. All studies support very high return for the vast majority of athletes. So basically, summary is the back pain that stops or limits participation, needs evaluation with thorough, thorough history and physical, Im proper imaging. Conservative treatment is often the first choice with therapy, athletic training, anti-inflammatories, possibly epidural injections. You want to always have a high suspicion of spondylolysis, so stress fractures in adolescent population, especially the extension athletes, the rowers, the gymnasts, offensive linemen. We also see them a lot in the baseball players and from that other studies. And options for disc injury in athletes, there's a lot of options. If they fail, you could have a microdiscectomy. Disc replacement can be considered a lumbar fusion. There's pluses and minuses to that as well. Um, but the goals of return to play are, are appropriate time frame. And again, 
if you try to sell these people short and do smaller procedures when they need a big one, it just delays their overall recovery because someone like Tiger Woods will have two small procedures. Peyton Manning had the same thing. So Peyton Manning had four spine surgeries, but three of them didn't work. So, if he, so he had three microdiscectomies of a cervical spine, okay? And he finally had a fusion and a single level ACDF and felt great and went back and won the Super Bowl. But he lost like two years, you know, a year and a half of playing time because he kept having these small procedures where if he just had the fusion first, he probably would have done great and gone back to playing much sooner. So sometimes you just got to do the surgery that you need, not the surgery you want. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Chiapetta. Our next presenter is uh, Dino Pinciotti. Dino is the director.